Now, this morning, we have been on a series for a few weeks. We've been talking about how you step into your purpose. And so, the first week, we started talking about running towards your destiny, how important that is. Some people say, well, I didn't hear it. It's on YouTube, or you can go on our website, and it's right there. You can listen to it. Also, last week, we talk, talked very specifically about his peace is on you, the peace on you. So, we talked about that. Today, we got to pray because this is going to be the third part in the series and the Lord has something to say to you. Yes. Praise God. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you thanks and praise for your word. We trust you, Father, as the things are spoken this morning, that we receive that and we become active in that. I give you praise, Father. You said you must be a doer of the word and I thank you that we are doing just that. I praise you, Lord God, for using me today, my mind, my will, my intellect, my emotion, every part, that it be all of you and none of me. And I give you thanks, Lord God, for the move of the Spirit in this service this day, that we hear the word and it make a difference in our life. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Open your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 8. Yeah. Romans 8. We're going to start in verse 28. Romans 8, 28. Romans 8.28, if you have not read this before, underline it in your Bible. Romans 8.28, it says this, and we know, everybody say, and we know, and we know, and we know, this is something we know, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. This is what the word says, and we know, we know this, we know that all things work together for good. God is a good God. We need to keep this in mind. He's such a good God. He's got good plans for you. And with that in mind, we need to understand something. Not everything that happens came because it was in the plan of God. I've had people tell me, well, it happened because it was the plan of God. No, God will get you through it. But in this world, you're going to have tribulation. That's not the plan of God. His plan is for you to prosper and be in health. His plan is for you to have success. His plan is for you to get through things and overcome. That's his plan. So God's plan is different. The world's plan, the world's plan, the devil's plan is to make sure that you have trouble. In this world, there's going to be trouble. God never promised you that you were going to have smooth sailing all the time. Now, we get confused because I've had people say, well, if you get saved, you'll have smooth sailing the rest of your life. I've been doing this 40 years, and I can tell you, that's not true. <laughs> There's going to be some tough times, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to be bypassed by the things of God. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Now, God didn't promise you that you'd never have a bad time, but what he did promise you is that as long as you're in this broken world, he said you'll overcome. Now, we live in a broken world. Nothing in this world is perfect. We live in a broken world. Our bodies are broken. <laughs> they don't always perform the way they should. Our, our minds, come on, come on now. Help me now. Our minds are a little broken. They don't always perform the way they should. Come on, somebody ever walk in a room and went, what was I in here for? <laughs> Because it happens that way, the weather is not always for sure. Things aren't always the way you expect. The economy's not right. It's broken. Relationships are not right. Many of them are broken. God offers perfection when you get to heaven. He said in heaven there's no sorrow, there's no sadness, there's no sickness, there's no illness. Uh, it's all, he said gold is so, so fabulously everywhere that even the streets are made with gold. It's no big deal to God. Now... We can't expect perfection in this broken world because God said you're going to be able to overcome any trouble. In the midst of all the brokenness in this world, God is still working. He says all things work together for good, good or bad. For those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. That includes everything, every time, everywhere, Every person, yes. all things work together for good. Some of you say, well, I wish I'd never met you. 
<laughs> no, it's going to work together for good. Somewhere on that conversation of that meeting is going to lead you to the next meeting where God's going to work it out for you. All things work together for good. Now, how many have read 1 Thessalonians 5.18? It says something like this. In everything, give thanks. Come on, this is the will of God. In everything. You can't say in everything give thanks unless you understand Romans 8 and verse 28. All things work together for good. So you can give thanks in all things, not for all things, but in all things because it's going to work together for good. Right. Are you with me? Right. Now, if you understand that, then you also understand Philippians 4.4 because 4, it says like this, rejoice in the Lord always. And if you missed it the first time, let me say it again. Again, I say rejoice. You cannot say rejoice in the Lord always unless you believe Romans 8.28 that says all things are going to work together for good. Yes. It can't work together for good if you won't believe it. Are you with me? Because faith still works. Faith still works. Which brings us to John 14 and verse 21. It says it like this. It says, he who has my commandments. In other words, those that know my commandments. If they have my commandments and keep them. And keep them. It is he that loves me. And if he loves me, my father is going to love him. And I will love him. And I will manifest myself unto him. Amen. Amen. He says, I'm going to manifest myself unto him. Now, this is really important. Because if you have the commandments of God, you keep the commandments of God, he says, you prove that you love him. Many of us yield to temptation. And the Bible says you should stop yielding to temptation. Don't yield to anger. Don't yield to that. Don't yield to offense. Don't yield to bitterness. Because when you do, you do not show that you love the Lord by keeping his commandments. Because he said, don't let that stuff bother you. He says, don't let discouragement overtake you or even feeling sorry for yourself. Which happens pretty much every day. <laughs> And he said, don't let that happen. You got to make a stand right here, right now. You got to make a stand. In other words, today we're going to be discussing this. Draw the line. This is the place. Yes. This is the place. This is the place. This is the place. Now, this is the third part of that series, which the Lord said, step into, step into your purpose today today. This is the place. You've got to make a decision. We're going to start today with Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11. Look at this. Ephesians 1 and verse 11. Somebody said, I thought you already started. That's just introduction. <laughs> now, now we'll get into it, okay? Ephesians chapter 1, you look at verse 11, says it like this. It says, in him we were also chosen. In him we were also chosen. Having been predestined. We have been predestined according to the plan of him who works everything into conformity to the purpose of his will. Now that sounds a lot like he wor we know all things. He's going to work them together for good. But it says that in Ephesians 1 and verse 11, it says he takes everything and works it into the conformity of his perfect will. Just because you have a problem doesn't mean the problem has you. You have to see he takes a hold of it and brings it alongside and said, let me work this on into your perfect will right here. I'm going to make sure this is going to work out for you. And so it agrees with what it said before because purpose yes. is not always visible. Yes. Problems are visible. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> purpose is not always visible. We see things happen and we go, oh, this is a problem. And we go around saying things like this. We don't go around and say, hey, tell me four or five things that are good. We go around and say, hey, what's wrong? <laughs> what's wrong? Our news media encourages us. Let's talk about something wrong. Let's talk about wrong. And we spend our time trying to think, well, we got to be like everybody else. Let's talk about what's wrong. And so we see somebody downtrodden or a little bit discouraged and we say, what's wrong? Tell me some stuff that's wrong instead of stopping and saying, come on, tell me about some things that are right. Because if we change our thoughts, we can change our life. And problems are always visible. Not all, it's not always so with purpose. Let's look at Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14, we're going to start in verse 5, Exodus 14. Now it was told to the king of Egypt, that's Pharaoh, and the, that the people... 
Those are the slaves. They had fled. The word came to the king that all the people had fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and all of his servants then turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? We let all Israel go, those that were serving us. What have we done? What have we done? Why have we done this? So he made ready his chariot and he took his people with him. Now this is important. He also took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt. Now we're talking about a heavy pursuit going to happen here. He's got all the chariots that are in Egypt with the captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness so that the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and the chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea of Pihiroth before Baal Zephon. Aren't you glad you didn't have to say that? <laughs> but there they are. All those people showed up and they trapped them. They got them down there and they've trapped them. Now, here's the deal. In this world, we know purpose. Oh, yeah, we say yes, purpose of God. Hallelujah, purpose of God. But what do we see here? We see problems. <laughs> Listen, problem is Pharaoh is chasing them. That's the problem. The problem is that, that he's out to get them so we can get them back. Yeah. Anybody ever had somebody tell you, I'm going to get you back. Yeah. I'm going to get you back. That's a thought going on in their mind. He's going to get us back. Yeah. The problem is they have left who they have become. They have become something else because they left who they had been. God says, I'm trying to get you somewhere. All things are going to work together for good even though the past is chasing you. Even though it's chasing you, all things are going to work together for good for those that love God and called according to his purpose. Now, there is an activated purpose in the chasing of the children of Israel by the armies of Pharaoh. We have difficulty understanding the purpose. Don't you know the children of Israel were even more confused than us? <laughs> Armies are following them. Big clouds of dust going in the air, chasing the children of Israel. And they're saying one to another, I don't understand this. God was delivered. I thought God was delivering us. And now they're coming after us. They're going to kill us. Don't you understand? They're going to kill us. Yeah. And sure enough, they're coming after them because they couldn't see what was happening they could see what is happening now but they could not see what is going to happen that's where all of us are we can see what is happening now but we can't see what is going to happen if we had future vision we'd have a whole different perspective but we can't see what's going to happen but the Lord's saying I want to help you with what is about to happen this is about to happen. And he promised us this was going to happen. Now here's something very important. You may not see his purpose. But in retrospect, we go, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw, yeah, that's what the Lord was doing there. I can see that. That's, that's, that's what God was trying to do. He he's taking care of me. And some of us even change our lingo to kind of act like we knew all the time. Sure. When we didn't know. That's right. The children of Israel did not know. These are runaway slaves. These are runaway slaves. And even if they outran Pharaoh's chariot, they were always going to remain slaves, looking over their shoulder all the time because Pharaoh would always be after them. As long as Pharaoh was chasing them, they were always going to be slaves. And even though... Even though they were no longer being oppressed by Pharaoh and all of Egypt, as long as the oppressor lived, the potential for oppression still remained. 
They could sense the fullness of the pressure. This is what oppression is about. Oppression does not mean that you've actually been trapped, but that you have the sense that you're about to be trapped. There are people suffering from oppression that don't have any oppression going on now at all. And I want to tell you something. These are people that are in slavery. You don't have to be in bondage to be in slavery. You just have to be in fear to put you in bondage to slavery. Are you with me? I'm delivered from the bondage, the Bible says. I've been delivered from the bondage of the devil. But you have got to change your mind because the devil's constantly putting the thought, I'll get you back. I'll get you. I'm going to get you back. Come on, everybody's had some kind of sin in their life. The Bible calls it the wiles of the devil. It's the method to which he knows how to get you. He knows where you are. He knows where you live. He knows, he knows that he can send it enough times by you, you're going to give in to it. And so he blocks, he blocks, he, pu he pushes, he pushes. The word devil in the Greek, it also means this, penetration. It means that he's going to get to a point where he's hit you so many times he finally has a breakthrough. And he's going to push on that and push on that. And he's going to constantly remind you, I'll get you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. And some people even are scared of the devil. They say, oh, don't say anything. It might hurt his feelings. <laughs> I don't want him to get after me. Oh, yeah. And see, I think that that's true because some people are afraid for their life. I wonder how many people are afraid to be happy because they're concerned it might not last. I wonder how many people, how many people are afraid to love because they've lost in love before. I wonder how many people are afraid to try because they might fail. Isn't that interesting? But it's a fact. It's a fact. As long as you've allowed Pharaoh to chase you, you're still going to be a slave. As long as you continue to give in to the thought, he's right there on top of me. Everything is going to go down in a few minutes. It's looking pretty good right now, but I can't count on this because it might change any second. Where did you get that thought? That's a demonic thought. That's not from God. He came to give you life and life more abundantly. Amen. And as long as you allow him to chase you, you'll never be free to your highest and best that God caused, called you to be. You're being oppressed by the oppressor because he's always approaching you. Some people say, oh, I, I could sense the devil. I could sense the devil in there. I could sense, well, huh? He's out to kill, steal, and destroy. He's looking for those that are weak. You always are going to sense him. What do you do when you sense him? You big, you tough up. You become puffed up with Christ. And you say, me and him are standing against you. Because <laughs> things are different when you stand against him with companionship in the Lord. Come on, some of us have heard any day now, any day now, I'm going to get you. I'm after you. I'm at, well, let me put it this way. Maybe somebody's heard some stuff like this. That addiction is coming back. That compulsive behavior is coming back. Those thoughts, they're going to turn into action soon like, like they did before. Come on, everybody's had some kind of thought like that. This may not always last. Goodness may, always, may not always stay. The devil's quick to remind us that he's out to kill, steal, and destroy. But God came to give you life and give it to you more abundantly so you can say, no way, I've given myself to the Lord. Hallelujah. You ever seen somebody that's helping to hold somebody in depression? Of uh, They're compulsively dominating someone else. And they say things like this. No matter where you run, you can't hide from me. I'll find you. You may think you'll get away with it. I'm going to find you. Even if you go into some remote hotel, I'll find you somewhere. And you're always going to love me. I'm always going to love you. I'm always going to chase after you. Oh, I think I've stirred somebody's emotions up in here because they've got some memories about folks like that. But the Bible says... When folks are trying to dominate you, you need to stand on the word and not let those thoughts come. Because living 
with a threat is not living at all. In Exodus 14, it gets to verse 21, and it says it like this. In Exodus 14, it says in verse 21, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all night, and made the sea look like dry land. And in the midst of the sea there was dry ground, and the waters to the right was a wall, and the waters to the left was a wall. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after, because all of Israel went through the midst of the sea. And, and Pharaoh and his horsemen all went in to follow after them. And that's a pretty interesting word because God takes his children right on through the water and the water moved out of the way. I'm sure that they stirred there and went, now this is a problem. We're backed up against the water. What are we going to do? God says, Moses, get the rod. And put his rod up and the sea opened up. I'd have loved to have seen that. I don't think Cecil B. DeMille's did a very good job making that scene what it really looked like. But, but it must have been fantastic to watch the whole thing back up and they went through on dry ground. And Pharaoh called his men and said, all y'all, come on, we're going down there. And it says in Exodus 14 and verse 26, And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand again over the sea, and that the waters might come back over the top of the Egyptians and on the chariots and on the horsemen. And so Moses stretched out his hand over the sea again. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned up to its full depth, and while the Egyptians were fleeing in it. And so the Lord overthrew all the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and the army of all Pharaoh and it came into the sea after them and not so much as one of them even remained. Can you imagine? That was the power of God. But the children of Israel had walked through on dry ground in the midst of the sea and the water of the wall was on the right hand and on the left hand and the Lord saved all of Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Wow. wow. <laughs> this is some powerful words here. Because you got to see this. The waters returned upon all of the Egyptians. And everything that was of God came out of the water. And everything that was not of God was drowned in the water. Whoa. And this is something that you need to see. There was rejoicing coming on. When they came out of the water. And the problem was found no more. The problem was found no more. Isn't it good when all things work together for good for those that love God and called according to his purpose? Because you say, and the problem is no more. The problem is no more. Oh, hallelujah. The problem is no more. And so then in Romans 6 and verse 4 and 5, it says it like this in Romans 6. It says, therefore... We are buried with him in baptism unto death that the likeness of Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of God the Father. Even so, we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we all shall, shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. For he that is dead is freed from sin, verse 7 says. Now, this is important because this is death, burial, and resurrection. Death, burial, and resurrection. He that is dead is freed from sin. Amen. Baptism is the likeness of his death. Yes. And the likeness of his resurrection. Dead is paid by death, burial, and resurrection. Pharaoh was chasing them because he thought he owned them. But God told Pharaoh, through Moses, Israel is my son, my firstborn son. Now some people say, well, I didn't know that. God was saying, listen, I'm going to do something. I'm going to allow your sons to die until you let my son go. 
And during that Passover night, the death angel came in through all of Egypt and went to every house, every house. And if it did not have blood on the doorpost, the firstborn child died. And even the firstborn offspring of all the animals died. Because it says, God was showing them, I'll show you what it's like to lose a son. Now, in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 22, some of you need to see this in your own Bible because you wouldn't believe me when I said Israel is the firstborn son. But Exodus, it says in verse 4, and chapter 4 and verse 22, it says, And thou shalt say to Pharaoh, this is what God said to Moses, say this to Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn son. That's right in the Bible. That's what God told Moses to tell Pharaoh, Israel is my son. Now here's why that's so important. Here's why that's so important. Because Pharaoh said, those are my slaves. And God says, no, he's my son. And so Pharaoh said, he's my slave. And God said, no, he's my son. Yes. And Pharaoh said, I'm going after my slave. Yes. And God said, I will deliver my son. Yes. <laughs> Can you see that? Yes. And you need to see something. God's having the same conversation about you. Yes, We're sons and daughters of God. Amen. Amen. Whatever is chasing you, the enemy says, that's my slave. That's my slave. And God says, no, that's my son. <laughs> that's my son. That's my son. Now, the son runs up to the water. You got to catch this now. The slave came up to the water. But when the slave went through the water... He came out a son. Because there was something that happened in the water. God says, that's it. This is the place. That's the dividing line. There is no more. This is the final step. This, I'm drawing the line right here. This is the place. And so, God says, I want you to see something. You got to see it. This is the place. Amen. This is the place. He says, I'm making sure I want to declare this because when you say this is the place, some monumental things happen in your life when you declare this is the place. Amen. Number one. You ready for this? Number one. This is the place of transformation. Yeah. Transformation. Because see, you were former slaves, but you went through the water. And you came out on the other side. And now I recognize you and you recognize it yourself. You are a son. You are a son. This is the place of transformation. This is where I learned to think differently. This is where I learned to act differently. This is where I learned to give differently. This is where I learned to live differently. This is where I learned to love differently. Because this is the place, this is the place of transformation. This is the place where I stopped acting like a slave and I started acting like a son. Wow. This is the place you are translated because of a renewed mind. In Romans 12, 2, it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that perfect and acceptable. And he says, What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Ooh, glory. We are not conformed, we're transformed. We're transformed. We went into it a slave. We came out of it a son. Oh, glory. Now, people, I, I'm always amazed when people say, say to us, you need to uh, act like who you are. You ever heard that? Somebody say, act like who you are. I've had that happen to me oh, a lot of times in my life. But usually when folks say that, they're referring to who I uh, used to be as who I are. <laughs> yeah. 
Because who I am now is not who I used to be. But some folks don't relate to who I am now. They can only remember me as who I was. Don't you remember? We were friends in kindergarten. I don't remember you. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not jogging my memory. They'll say things like, you were born on the wrong side of the tracks. Quit trying to act all goody two-shoes. You were, you were raised by, a, by a, a single parent. How dare you act like that? Well, let me tell you something. Uh, this is important. I left all that in the water. <laughs> I left all that in the water. Because when I went through the water, I quit acting like a slave. I came out like a son. This is where whoever, if you've ever been baptized, you ought to take a note. You ought to, ch you ought to change your action. You ought to say, look, I'm done acting like the slave. I came out of the water, and now I'm a son. That was it. That was the drawing line. That's why you get baptized. That's the line right there. You can't look at me that way anymore. I came out of the water, and bless God, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. All my old self is gone. That's the way it is. You got to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, what I do know is this. What I do know is I don't know everybody's it. I don't know everybody's it. But what I do know is it should stop right now. Because there's a line. There's a line and it's got to stop right now. Whatever it is, it's got to stop right now. I don't care what the devil's been trying. It's got to stop right now. Right now. Some of you, it's been sickness. Some of you, it's been financial challenge. Some of you, it's been relationships. It's got to stop right now. Amen. Now, he came to give you life and life more abundantly. This is the time of abundant harvest. He didn't say you came to deal with it over and over. He said, this has got to draw the line and this is it. This is the place. This is it. While we are here, I'm sure God said this. He said, while we're here, let's just settle this matter once and for all. I'm done with Pharaoh and all that stuff chasing you. This is it. When they go through the water to get after you, what has been trying to chase you will no longer chase you because I done washed it away. This is it. This is the place and it stops right here. Yes. Some of you need to say out loud, this is my last cigarette. This is my last drink. You mean Christians drink? All the time. I met hundreds. And they don't think anything wrong with it. You know, the Bible says you can take a drink from now and then. It says that. But if you're taken to ministry, you should be taken to no drink. And somebody said, well, what do you mean? Well, the Bible says we're all ministers. I don't want to get confused in my thoughts. How about you? I don't want them to be, be shaken. Some of y'all to make a decision. It's my last extra boyfriend. <laughs> now listen, we might agree. I was weak last month. I was weak last night. But this is it. I'm drawing the line. I'm not going to do that anymore. That's it. I'm done. When I got out of the hospital personally, I drew a line. I said, this is it. Right? This is it. My mental abilities will be better than they ever were before. I'm going to do more than I ever could do before. Somebody said, you made that decision right there. I said, this is it. That's it. Some of you saying, you're having all kinds of physical problem and you haven't made a declaration. This is it. You draw the line and you say, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to feel that anymore. I'm not going to have that happen to me anymore. You know, it doesn't say in the Bible when you get old, you get decrepit. But we pass that by the word of our mouth to one another. Well, you know, he is old. Why are we playing the old card for him? Come on. There are some things that you've gone through that is a deciding factor for the rest of your life. This is it. This is the place. Number two, this is the place of identification. This is the place of identification. This is the place. They didn't actually die in baptism. They are in the likeness of death 
burial, and resurrection. In baptism, we don't actually die. I know that's a shock to some people. We didn't actually pass away in the baptism. But we are in the likeness of Christ. So we take on that identification of death and burial and resurrection with Christ. And we read this in Romans 6 and verse 4. It says we are buried with him in baptism. In baptism unto death. That we like as Christ. Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of God the Father. Even so we should walk in newness of life. If you've been baptized, you've got to say to yourself, that's it. I've already crossed through that threshold. I've had it happen. No more will I give in to that because I said this is the place. I went through the water. Amen. I went through the water. It's where you are identified with Christ. If you've been baptized, you're identified. Somebody said, that's why they say you should receive Christ, you should accept him as your Savior, and be baptized. Why be baptized? It's a symbol that you've identified with Christ. And everybody knows you've identified with Christ. Amen. In Matthew 3, and it gets to verse 15, it says it like this. Jesus answered, and he said to them, Permit it to be so. Permit it to be so now. For thus it's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. When you've been baptized, you've got to say, Wait a minute. I'm doing this in the righteousness of God. He said do this to fulfill all righteousness. All righteousness. It's fitting for me to fulfill all righteousness. You identify with him. If you've been planted with him. If you've been buried with him. You are raised with him in the likeness. It's an identity thing. You've been raised like him. In likeness of Christ. I didn't die. But it's like I did. It's like I did. So when you're baptized. It's like you have died to your old man. That's why you get baptized. Amen. Amen. You died to the old man. Amen. You got to tell Pharaoh, leave me alone. Yes. I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <clears throat> a few months after my father died, that's many years ago, but a few months after my father died, I called the bank. I tried to settle my father's debts. I was trying to take care of this by phone. Trying to settle my father's debts. He borrowed some money against a CD, one of his long-term bank accounts. He borrowed some money against that, and we wanted to finish that and make sure that was done. So I called them, and the collector said, there's a bill that your father owes. <clears throat> and I said, I'm sorry to tell you, but my father is deceased. And he said, how am I going to be paid? And I said to him, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. One thing I do know is death pays all bills. See, the Bible even quotes that in Romans 6 and verse 7. It says, he that is dead is free from sin. Death pays all bills. Jesus' death paid the bill. You don't owe your addiction anything. If it once tried to have you, you don't owe it anything. You don't owe compulsive behavior anything. You don't owe your past anything. You don't have to explain it. You don't have to feel guilty. You don't have to surely serve that thing anymore. You've been made free in Christ. Now, if you allow what happened to you to control you in any manner, you have incarcerated Yourself. That pretty bold words. But true. Amen. You know in several churches we've been working with. I mean we've worked in churches 40 years. But several churches we work with. People come out of the water during baptism. Oh, glory to 
God. And, and they scream and they, and they yell. And I, I was baptized in Israel and, and I got to assist all the baptisms. And there were about 300 people getting baptized. I'm down in the Jordan River and I'm helping people get that out of the water. And they'd come out of the water, spring out. Oh, glory to God. And they go walking out of the water. And I, I realized something. It's because they're so happy about what they left in the water. <laughs> They're just happy for what they left in the water. Amen. Now, praise God. Now, number three. Number three. This is the place of a firm foundation. This is the place. You got to make a decision on whom you'll stand. This is the place of a firm foundation that's going to become a reference point for the rest of your entire life. There's got to be a place that you say this is it. This is a place of a renewed firm foundation in you. God will give you a firm foundation. He says, I want you to count on me. This is a firm foundation. This is getting back to what we know about Christ. This is what we know. This is what we know. This is the place. Some people need to look back at your salvation and say, that's it right there. Because sometimes we give in and say, well, I've fallen back since then. Why? How many houses you have fall down on you? If you've got a firm foundation, it's going to stand. You better check your foundation. Amen. Check your foundation. There are some things, some things that you just need to know and know that you know that you know. And one thing is you have your foundation in Christ. Some things you need to know. I don't care if people come to you and say, Hey, I've been reading this book all about transcendental meditations. I don't need that. I got Christ. Thank you very much. Get out of my life. People come to you and say, I heard this new philosophy about this Mideastern guy. He's got this thing in the middle of his head. You're going to love it. I don't want to love it. I don't want to. I'm serving the Lord Christ. I don't want no astrology. I don't want nobody call me on the psychic hotline. I got God. I, need, I got a firm foundation. How about you? I got a firm foundation. I'm not gonna know, I'm not gonna play with that. I'm not gonna dig around in that. I don't I don't wanna know, go play with no Ouija board. I don't want to go to no psychic. I don't need none of that. Because I know that I know that I know I've had an encounter with Jesus. He's on the firm foundation. That's my solid rock. I'm gonna stand with that in Jesus' name. I'm sure of this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it gets to verse 11, says it like this. No other foundation can anyone lay uh, except that which was laid, which is Christ Jesus. There's no other foundation but Christ Jesus. There's no other foundation but Christ Jesus. I'm sure of this. God wants to give you a firm foundation. God's going to make sure that you're able to stand through anything. You're not made to fall back and come back and fall back. You're made to stand. Amen. Amen. And God's going to prove it again no matter what circumstance, no matter what situation, He will deliver you. That's His promise. He'll deliver you from all unrighteousness. He'll make you stand in the fullness of God. Now, we've talked about this. Firm found, Say with me. I'll stand in this. This is the place of a firm foundation. Number four. This is the place, you ready for this? Of debt cancellation. Somebody needs to write this down. You need to hear this. Abundant Harvest Year. He said this is the place of debt cancellation. Now let me explain. The night before all the children of Israel made the exodus from Egypt... The Bible says in the King James, they went around and borrowed from the Egyptians. Let's take a look at that. Oh, glory. <laughs> in Exodus chapter 12, let's look at verse 35. I'm going to be reading to you from the New King James. It says it like this. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses... And they asked from the Egyptians, in the King James it says they borrowed, they asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. 
and the Lord had given the people great favor in the sight of all the Egyptians, so they granted them everything they requested. And then look what it says. Thus, they plundered all of Egypt. <laughs> they took all the wealth. They took everything they had. They took all the gold. They took all the silver. They even took their clothes. Are you with me? They took it all. And the Bible says that everybody was so weighted down with so much stuff, even the children were dragging with all the gold and silver. They were dragging with all the gold and silver. There's so much gold and silver, so much gold and silver, so much gold and silver. And Pharaoh was chasing them. I don't, he was think, I don't think he was chasing them just because they were slaves, but they'd taken all the gold and silver. <laughs> they got our stuff. And you know, all the guys that were talking with Pharaoh, they said, why did we let them do that? Let's go get our gold and silver and our clothes. <laughs> they got all of our stuff. And they're gone. What are we going to do? So much gold. So much silver. So much gold. So much silver. In fact, when Moses got ready to finally build a sanctuary unto the Lord, it gets way over in Exodus. It gets way over there in Exodus in, in 36 and verse 6. And Moses was ready to build a sanctuary unto the Lord. And so Moses sent word to the people, and he said this, Stop giving! Yeah. I've never heard another preacher do that. <laughs> because they had so much gold and so much silver, they had to stop their giving, and the people finally did. They stopped giving. So much gold, so much silver, so much gold, so much silver. Let me say that one more time. So much gold. <laughs> so much silver. So much. So much. Moses had to stop them from giving. You know why? When you lavishly have plenty and you love God, it's easy to give. That's why the Lord called this the year of abundant harvest. Because when you love God and it's coming in over over, over anything you've ever seen before. It's way easy to give. God's going to bless his nation and he's going to bless his people through you because everybody has so much. The minister finally going to have to say, that's enough. <laughs> Amen. You know why so much money comes in? Proverbs 13, it's verse 22. It says, the wealth of the sinner has been laid up for the just. And it starts that whole conversation by saying this. It says, and a good man will leave an inheritance to his children's children. I think if you look at it the other way around, it makes a whole lot more sense. The wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just, and a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. How come? Because he got all the wealth that he never had before. It's easy to lay up inheritance for your kids and their kids and their kids when you got more than you could ever, ever think about. Come on. You have got to see this. God did something in those Egyptians' life and in those Israelis' life that no one has seen like this before. God transferred the wealth from the wicked right into the hands of the just. And God says, I've given you this promise. The wealth of the sinner has been laid up for you. He says the righteous will receive it in this time. The wealth of the sinner has been laid up for the just. Not only will you get blessed, but your children will get blessed too. And their children. How many would say, oh yeah, count me in, come on, count me in. Because they're children's children. but We're talking about generational wealth. He said, I'm pouring this on you. God's giving it to you. He said, I'm going to pour it out, press down, shaking together, running over. They're going to give it to you. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's why 
They could not outrun Pharaoh. Now think about it. They had all the gold. They had all the silver. The children were even weighted down. You know why it took them so long to get through the desert? You know, you can't move too good like this. <laughs> it took them a long time because they had so much gold and so much silver. That's why God had to do a miraculous deliverance in the desert. Was because he wanted them to see, this is the lion. No more will they be chasing you. I'm going to deliver you and give you supernatural debt cancellation. Ooh. This is the place. He said, I'm sending transfers. I'm sending, I'm sending favor. I'm sending opportunities. I'll lay upon you wealth and abundance that you never even thought of. I've had people say, well, I don't have any rich relatives that might die. Honey, you're going to be surprised where it comes from. The wealth of the sinners being laid up. Somebody say, you know any sinners that got money? Oh, they've just been laid it up for you. <laughs> Are you with me? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9 says it like this. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9, it says, and it is written, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither is hidden in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. God makes all things work together for good for those that what? We started out with that, we end up with that. Because it's those that love him going to end up with the stuff. He says, you can't even imagine what I got in store for those that love me. Oh, glory to God. Come on, say it with me. I'm blessed. blessed. This is the place. Come on, say, I'm blessed. This is the place. This is the place. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that every person in this place today that has heard the word of the Lord to them, they make a decision, Father, and say, that's it. This is the place. I'm coming through this. I've made a decision. I'm going through this thing right now. No weapon that's been formed against me will prosper. I'm stepping into my purpose. I'm running towards my destiny. I have the peace of God on me, and this is the place. This is the place. I'll have this recollection that right now when I cross this line I'll never never go back to where I was again I'm moving on in Christ I'm moving on into what he said now listen carefully if you know that you know that it's your life that's moving ahead you know that God is even speaking to you and saying this is the, you need to declare out of your mouth this is the place and leave all that stuff behind you that's behind you get on with your life get on with your call get on with your love right now right now this is the place I want you to raise your hand we're gonna pray if you know that you know this is the place God's directing you to have more than you've ever had before. And you say, I see that. This is the place. I need to make that decision once again. I'm deciding to stand strong in God. This is the place. For those that raise your hand, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that God lay upon you the fullness of his identity. The fullness of transformation. The fullness of, of foundation and debt cancellation be on you in Jesus' name. That the wealth of the sinners been laid up for the just and you have your household blessed in Jesus' name. The fullness of God blessed you in all ways in every way in health and wholeness and wellness and your home be filled with financials finances and you have plenty in store to give to every good work you have all kinds of acquaintances that become friends once again and I pray for your life to be renewed vigor in Christ and I give you praise Lord God thank you Jesus thank you Jesus. now keep your heads bowed and eyes closed for just a minute Oh, yes, Lord. We want to take this time, Father, to pray some specific prayers. What would you have? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There are some folks that say, pray with me, agree with me, to stand against the work of darkness. For some of you, it's a brother that's been declared cancer in his body. 
for some people to say, I've got relatives that are dealing with some financial despair. Some of you say, I have a, 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 right now, there's so much inconsistency in my life. There's nothing that's landed on a firm foundation in this world, but I'm going to stand on the firm foundation of Christ. If you know you've got some area in your life that you need to have us stand with you in prayer to work against the, the works of darkness, and you know that you, raise your hand, because we're going to pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, for every hand that's gone up and said, stand with me, stand with me. I receive the fullness of God, the favor of God, the witness of God. I receive his goodness right now, and I will get through this situation, this circumstance, and see that this is the victory of the Lord in my life once again. I give you praise, Lord God. I stand with each one here that says, yes, pray with me, agree with me, stand with me. The fullness of God is loosed in my life right now in Jesus' name. Stand with me for the, the salvation of my children. Stand with me for the victory in my life. Stand with me for the, the loving care even of my neighbors that I lead them to the Lord. Stand with me that I have the fulfilling of Christ in my life now in Jesus' name. I pray for those that are dealing with some men, mental you're dealing with mental. I'm talking about even from simply like saying, I can't remember that. I don't remember their name. I'm praying for you that you have perfect memory. God calls your brain to remembrance right now. He said he will bring to you the remembrance of all things. If you are a candidate to have your memory recharged, raise your hand. I am pray for you to have your memory recharged and that you think good thoughts. Think about these things good and lovely and good report and virtue and praise. You think on these things and every good thing is brought to your memory again in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.